Welcome to Design Talk 4. This design talk is about a roll top box that I've designed. Hopefully this isn't too simple a design to pique your interest. So let's look at this new design and discuss what my motivations were, what my approach was, and what my thoughts were as I went along. Eventually we'll look closely at the live model and drawings in SolidWorks. As I mentioned in Design Talk Notch Box, I'd been thinking about hinges and catches for 3D printed boxes. This roll top box was also designed with those things in mind. Check out Notchbox Design Talk if you want an additional look at hinges and catches and a deeper look at 3D printer considerations. Also check out my TurboCAD tip number 33 if you want to see additional insights into 3D printing. If you recall the Notchbox Design Talk, you'll remember the print in place hinged container. I talked about this with its socket hinges. Having been thinking about how else that hinge could be utilized, I happened across this roll top box design while looking for inspiration on the internet. I'm not sure that the roll top box I noticed is the one pictured here on the right, but it was definitely something similar. Having played around with the print in place box, I knew right away that this type of hinging would be perfect since it had a great range of motion. Once I began designing the box, my wife had a look and said that it reminded her of a pencil case she had when she was a kid. I asked her to point out which style she had back then, and she indicated the one pictured here on the left. She wasn't, however, too keen on it being called an antique. I looked around a bit more and saw a few styles I recognized from days gone by. The ones on the right are a pencil case and a geometry set case, both plastic and both with roll-top lids. I should mention that there was no sleepless nights during the design process for this box since I had the concept nailed down in my mind right from the start. It just took firing up SolidWorks to start working it all out. As is often the case, I decided that I would be using SolidWorks for this project. I love the parametric and constraint features of the program. It's the ideal CAD software program to use when one is developing new products and many edits are expected to be made over the course of development. So let's move into SolidWorks now and look at the roll top box in all of its glory. So here we have the roll top box in SolidWorks and in true SolidWorks fashion we can go ahead and open this up just like so and have a look at that. One thing I want to point out is that in SolidWorks we have some mates called path mates. So we can set this up so that these units here can follow along a path that's been established. In this case, we only have to attach the first and the second link, and then the ones that follow are, are a pattern on a curve. So basically we're placing only two. So as we move along and look at all these parts, we're gonna see that the hinging comes into play at the links. And then we're gonna utilize a magnet for a catch. Let's just go have a quick look at an exploded view here. So there's very few parts. And since that's the case, we'll go ahead and look at the build for each part. So let's right mouse click on the base here and select isolate. And let's have a look at this unit closely. So I'm going to right mouse click here and select edit part. Expand here and then I'm going to roll this up to see the steps we took. So I started with a simple profile from the side that looked like that. Then I did a simple extrude mid plane out to its desired size or width. Next I cut out the top like so. Next I added a side panel like so. And then I created the track in here by creating another profile along the edge here. Just looked like that and extruded that inward. Next I created a pinhole here. And then I mirror copied this all over to the opposite side like so. Next I created a stop down here by simply extruding a rectangle in this area. And I have just enough links so that when this comes back to about there, it stops at this location on the other end. Okay, so before I move to this next step here, 
the print orientation for this was in this orientation, like so. So looking at this, I could determine right away that this was going to create issues at this location. So if I was printing up in layers and I didn't have any supports to come up all the way to here, this would get some drop down of the filament as it was built. So in order to fix that, I added a full round fillet up here and that will take care of having to have supports in that area. So as it builds up layer by layer, it has no place to drop down from really. And the last thing I did was I added a recycle symbol down at the bottom here. So in this case, I'm using polypropylene. And having looked around at some of the things in my house, I noticed that most of the storage containers use polypropylene. And I got to thinking that even though polypropylene is the least recyclable product there is for plastics, it probably gets used a lot in this type of thing because it's not likely to be thrown out or recycled since it's intended to be a long-term use. So that's probably why you see polypropylene used for that quite often. So let's go ahead and stop editing the part, like so. Let's go ahead and switch to ISO view. Let's go ahead and select Exit Isolate. So next we'll look at the links. First we're going to start with this link here, the second one in, which is one of the ones I started with. I'm going to right mouse click and select Isolate. And then I'm going to go ahead and right mouse click over here and select Edit Part. So this is what I started with. So I'm going to roll this up and we'll have a look at the build. So here I just started by extruding a rectangle from mid-plane side to side. And then I created another profile to create the back portion like that. Then I revolved another profile to create this hemispherical protrusion. And then I mirror copied that over to the other side. Next I did a full round fillet on the front like so. And then I cut out this chunk in here. So you can see that this is a little bit wider than this end here, but this is where they're going to link together. Next I did a revolve cut to create a socket in here, which is going to accept the hemispherical protrusion from the next link. I mirror copied that over to the other side. And at this point I went ahead and I made a sketch that looks like this. So that's going to find the very center of mass for this unit at this point. That's going to be used to place on the path that we define later on. Next I did a cut extrusion over here to remove this material so that gives us a place to hinge at. And then I did the same on the other side. For some reason I couldn't mirror copy that so I had to do another full cut of it. Next boss extrusion, I created one to come and give us a full flat square up here. I wanted to tighten up the area a bit. And then during my trials, I saw that I needed to have a bit of a fillet there. Once that is in the track, you need to have some clearance so there's no interference when it's coming around that big arc at the back. Next here, this one isn't shown because I created the head link using configurations from this unit here, which we'll look at shortly. Same for there. This one here, this boss extrusion, is just a little bit I added in this area here. So the 3D printed box you saw is just using the links just like so. But I thought if we're going to injection mold this, we could tighten that up a little bit so there's a little bit less clearance in here. Now I didn't check that with the 3D print, but I certainly would if I intended to keep moving forward. Lastly, this one here is part of the other configuration. So I'm just going to stop this for now. Now I'm going to select here, and then I'm going to go change this to the head link, like so. Click OK, and there's the head link. So you can see it's very similar to this link with a little bit added to it. So I'm going to right mouse click here and select Edit Part. And we'll just go through these last few things that I had done with it. 
So there's the original link. So I extruded a rectangle to fill in this whole front portion. Then I added this little lip here that's going to act as a finger pole, basically. This was for the last unit, so now it is suppressed because it's not part of this unit. And then the last bit is I cut out this hole for the magnet here. It's very small, but I did find some really teeny ones at Amazon, so I thought that would work great. So I'm going to go ahead here and select this to stop the editing. And I'm going to select Exit Isolate. And looks like we've changed all of our units back to head links, so we need to change those. So I'm going to select this. Go here and change that to default. Click OK. And that should switch those back. I'm going to go ahead and select ISO view. So the next unit is here. It's the slot cap. So if we hide that for a moment, we can see that without that there and the pins holding it in place, this is how you'd load the assembly, sliding them in here, and then replace that cap just like so. So it's pretty straightforward. Let's just have a quick peek at it. Let's go ahead and isolate that. And let's go ahead and edit that part. So I started with a rectangle that I extruded, like so. Then I put a hole right through the whole unit. And I added another hole for the magnet on this side, just like so. Pretty straightforward and simple. Going to stop edit, exit isolate, and go back to isometric view. Next item is just a pin. So we'll isolate that. It's just a simple extruded circle with a chamfered end. So we can exit isolate. And the magnet was something I just created based on what I found on Amazon. So we'll select one of these and we'll isolate it. And it too is just a circle that's extruded and a couple of fillets on the edges, just like so. So I'm going to exit isolate. I'm going to select isometric view. I should mention that the links are pretty easy to put together. You just start with one, tuck one side in, bring the other up and clip it into place. It works pretty good. And now we're going to go ahead and look at the drawings quickly. So here's sheet one. This is the assembly drawing. Here I have an exploded view with the villa materials, the roll top closed, and the roll top opened. If we look down here, we have a typical title block designed by, drawn by. Here we've got a note about dimensions. In this case, we're using millimeters. A bit about copyright here, scale, and of course the title. One of the things you don't see here is drawing numbers. It's a good practice to use drawing numbers, and if you want to see what I used in my years in the glass door industry, go ahead and check out my TurboCAD tip number 24. Sheet 2 is layout. For layout, I typically go with a number of views and just illustrate what the envelope sizes are. Sheet 3 is the base, and here we're starting to look at each component on its own using dimensions and annotations as needed. And here we start to look at what we're going to use for materials. We'll talk a little bit deeper about materials when we get up to page 9. Sheet 4 is the head link. Again, just some views, some cross sections, and other details such as ensuring press fit for the magnet in this location. Materials again down here, which is going to be the same for the other part. Next is the link. Again, just views, cross sections as needed. Next is the slot cap. Again, just some views to illustrate what it looks like along with its sizes. Cross section to show some other details. And then again, a couple of notes talking about press fit for the slot cover pins and press fit for the magnet. Sheet 7 is the slot cap pin. 
It's a 52100 alloy steel with a Rockwell hardness of C52. I got it zinc plated. I just got this type of material by looking at some similar things on McMaster car. Again, we have a note about press fit. Sheet 8 is the magnet. As I mentioned earlier, I found something on Amazon, so I looked at what it talked about and put them in the notes. I'm pretty sure that you wouldn't buy these from Amazon if you're producing these in bulk, but it would certainly give you a lead on what you are looking for. Here we have a note again about the press fit. Sheet 9 is materials and finishes. I decided that if I was producing this, I'd offer six colors, and I'd like it to have a bit of a wood grain. So on this sheet, I've specified the colors, and I've specified the orientation of the grain. So I knew from looking around the house and seeing things in the stores that it was possible to get wood grain. So if we look here, we can see this is a register cover, and it's got a wood grain. So I suppose you'd emboss the grain and then just use a bit of a different color on there, or multiple colors, however it would work. Here we can see some decking again with some nice grain in it, different colors. And here we can see some tea moldings that have different wood grains in them. So I'm not exactly sure how they did this, but I'm pretty sure you could get it for the box as well. So I don't have any experience with applying any kind of etching onto molds and whatnot, but I did go ahead and look at the internet and get some insight into that. I saw from sites like this one where they can actually do that. And I suspect nowadays they can even do more than what they show here. So that's something I'd talk about with the injection mold supplier and list any details on my finish sheet that I needed to include in that. So that's the design in a nutshell and the thoughts and the motivations behind it. This is not something I'll be developing as a manufactured product, but it certainly could be. I hope that you enjoyed the presentation and that it'll give you some things to think about while designing your own products. If you'd like to see some TurboCAD tips for free, visit Don Check's TurboCAD tips page. If you're interested in delving deeper into TurboCAD learning, be sure to check out the full project tutorials on my TechShield Creations shopping page. See you next time.